Bonjour à tous et bienvenue sur la chaîne YouTube de Matar21. Tel que promis il y a quelques semaines en arrière à tous nos auditeurs, aujourd'hui j'ai le plaisir d'avoir en entrevue notre secrétaire général chez Carbon Connect, M. Josh Soloway. Uh, Josh qui va nous parler aujourd'hui en anglais alors qu'il il, il est unilingue anglais. Uh, par contre, donc, ce qui a été uh, discuté à travers notre communauté au fil des dernières semaines, c'est que YouTube fait un excellent travail de traduction. Alors, vous pouvez aller directement sur la vidéo, cliquer en bas sur « CC » et dans la, les « Settings », vous allez être en mesure à ce moment-là de pouvoir mettre la traduction francophone et de suivre l'entrevue avec Josh, tout simplement. Donc, je vais faire une entrevue en anglais qui sera par la suite, pour votre bénéfice, traduit par YouTube si vous le désirez. Sans problème de ce côté-là. Hello, Mr. Joshua Soloway. How are you today? Hello, Martin. It's been, it's been a while since uh, we had the conversation, since we had a, tin, a team meeting this morning, right? Yes, exactly. It's been just too long. I can't get enough of Martin. <laughs> so, a few weeks ago, we had an amazing interview with Jacques Prescott, you know, our ESG officer. Uh, later down the road, we had an interview as well with Brent Tolmy, our CEO. Uh, and now I wanted our investors and, you know, potential future investors to get to know you a little bit more as our general counsel. Um, I know for a fact that you are um, a lawyer as well in your uh, downtime, spare time. <laughs> uh, what can you tell us about yourself, Josh? Uh, well, I'm... I'm I am an attorney uh, practicing. I have a uh, background as an investment banker, uh, management consulting, tax structuring, uh, but started out my career in Silicon Valley uh, as the 12th employee of a SoftBank backed startup. We, a couple hundred plus when we were acquired and uh, did a little, a little ski bumming and uh, decided to go, go to law school, start a few businesses in between. And uh, you know, um, I guess I'll give my background. I, After law school, I worked for a specialized team of lawyers um, as a specialized as part of a specialized team of lawyers in New York City uh, at PricewaterhouseCoopers, where um, we were really structuring uh, tax funds or, or hedge funds, private equity funds, venture funds, energy funds, um, all around the world, and their investments all over the world, as well as doing portfolio reviews and such. So. Um, That really was the beginning of my exposure to the, the, the emissions markets. Um, I worked uh, structuring one of the world's first greenhouse gas credit aggregation pools, um, the largest carbon offset project in the world in, uh, in, in Asia at the time, um, and, uh, and various other things uh, in, in that space, structuring some Uh, environmental asset funds with primarily composed of emissions and greenhouse gas credit aggregation pools and such. Um, and so uh, that really brought me into the space. Uh, I worked in traditional commodities as well. I left uh, PwC, started my own law firm um, in on Wall Street. It was a boutique Wall Street firm um, in 2009 and uh, ran that for years working with uh, a lot of sort of resource companies, technology companies, uh, infrastructure players, and um, uh, ultimately also built a, an investment banking firm, a boutique investment banking firm on Wall Street with a partner of mine who was sort of a veteran of the industry and has since passed on. But he, um, uh, he had tremendous relationships with large institutional investors, insurance companies, specialty funds, et cetera. So we did quite a bit of, uh, Uh, of work uh, focused on the commodity space primarily, um, oil and gas pr producers, mining companies, and investors, investment arms of these various institutions. So I uh, did that for, a quite a, for, for a number of years, um, built the New York office of a company called Rainmaker, where we, uh, uh, we provided essentially management market, management consulting services focused on market expansion, so, so growth strategies and such. Um, I, I ran that for a few years. I did many of these things can, simultaneously because I had great partners. Um, ultimately, my law firm was acquired by a large firm, by an international firm 
And um, I found uh, legal practice to be a great uh, venue for me to do the kind of work I enjoy doing, sort of strategically advising my clients, getting involved. Um, but I've always done some things on the side. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So uh, that's, what, uh, that's what brought us together. And saw the opportunity here, uh, and, and not just the opportunity in the sense of uh, the carbon markets themselves, which are astronomical and can't possibly be overstated, but um, but also in this team and the vision. So that's that's really why uh, why we're 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 here and we're doing this. Uh, at least why I am. Um, the it's not something I do often in terms of. Uh, uh, getting involved as a, as a, as a principal with, in these sorts of ventures at this point in my career, because I work with a lot, I do, I do advise a number, I do get involved as an advisor, et cetera, as an investor, but this one is, is, is really special. So talking about your expertise, uh, you mentioned also technology. So you got some knowledge, I guess, regarding blockchain technologies and everything else. You've been involved in two projects which actually were startup in blockchain technologies building out of New York, if I'm not mistaken, correct? That's correct. I've, well, my practice uh, currently as an, as an attorney is really uh, focused mostly on technology companies and uh, some middle market companies but, and, and fund and investors. So I, my clients are venture funds and various of vari investors of various kinds, uh, you know, strides from angels to, uh, family offices and such. Uh, my clients are generally uh, mid to late stage technology companies. Sometimes, though I have a good healthy slice of, of startups because I can't help myself and I love startups. Uh, so I can't help myself but get involved. Um, they don't always make the best clients sometimes because they're, they don't have money yet. So, but but I try to pick the promising ones and, uh, and it's really a great, it's really great fun. And so I'm a partner at a firm called Moses and Singer. Um, I guess I'm supposed to say here that all the views expressed here are mine and not uh, necessarily that of the firm. Um, but uh, the it's a great firm. We've been um, in business for over 100 years. We've represented uh, Deutsche Bank since 1919. So uh, really storied history, New York firm uh, with uh, great people and great expertise uh, in the security space, the banking space, um, asset management, and it's just a really broad base, you know, technology, IP, it's really just a great firm. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's what I do daily, but I do work with blockchain companies, have a fair bit of experience in that arena, as well as general DeFi players and such. Sweet. Uh, so since you're located in New York, Josh, uh, of course, you're very close to Wall Street and this is where you operated most of your, you know, and got most of your experience for the last few years. Uh, we identified pretty early in Carbon Connect through all of the conversations that we had that there's two, I would say, two different kind of potential buyers in, in our market. So, of course, the emitters, you know, the, the company who do have some pollution and they need uh, to offset actually and compensate for that pollution that they do emit. Uh, and on the other end, there's the speculative side of things where you have some traders who wants to buy actually some offsets very early uh, in development stage, you know, that they can speculate on the future price because they expect the price to keep on rising. So knowing that you, you're really right in the middle of where everything goes, what can you tell us about the appetite, actually, of our kind of product that we are preparing for the market regarding, you know, the perception of things coming from Wall Street, actually? Well, you know, I, I, I would say it's increasingly, I mean, everyone knows this is an increasingly hot area, right? Everyone, every day in the Wall Street Journal and Financial Times, et cetera, it is, there's more news about regulation coming. So I'll start with the view. Um, the short answer is it's pretty clear. The all the commodity players that are, are seeing this is developing as a commodity, though it hasn't, the, the commodity futures trading commission, the CFTC here in the U S is, is pushing to sort of 
consider this a commodity and it's not clear they're trying to make their case right um and this being carbon so uh the the carbon the significant commodity traders from glencore to uh trafigura on and on and on all of these shops are that, that i've seen are are really ramping up their capabilities in trading carbon i mean carbon credits it's they're hiring new teams they're committing more resources they're ramping up one shop that um that we're talking to regularly uh just completed a significant private equity uh round and took in considerable capital i was speaking to them the other day they're they've completed that transaction and a lot of it was driven by the carbon uh focus the carbon credit focus that they have and the answer is go 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 boys so get the to the traders get out there start buying start finding good projects and and just get get those credits both from the investors from their board and from their clients who are yeah you know, they who are who are large emitters um, in one case they're they're they have an RFP for a significant volume. I can't really say too much about it um, of, of carbon credits uh, for uh, a considerable term. Um, and that's a, that's a, it's coming up quick with a, sh with a short time frame to get, it just shows the urgency. That's a very large emitter. Then you look at well, what's driving this. So on the, from the view from Wall Street, let's say, and from the US more broadly, um, you know, Wall Street keeps a, a close eye on on Washington D.C., right? And um, the, in any industry um, or in any as any sector within the commodities uh, uh, industry, traders are watching what kind of regulation is coming uh, and what the impact's going to be. So, what do we have happening here in the U.S.? Well, you have Chairman uh, the SEC Chairman uh, Gensler has said earlier this year and has continued to push and take action on it. He has said that previous SE actions and guidance, which was really only guidance, relating to carbon emissions disclosures was insufficient. So what does that mean? Well, it was insufficient because it was a voluntary sort of regime. You now the companies could choose to disclose how much they want and if they felt like it was going to be good to sort of good PR, um, if they want to disclose that they've been buying some voluntary credits and what have you then great that but that's a nice guy sack kind of yeah. thing, right we want to look like good guys okay fine right. um that that's not enough anymore to investors in the us and to the the, the regulators so sec chairman gensler has now said he, he wants to push for mandatory disclosure on climate risks and climate and emissions from all public companies, right? So that's a huge change. That's a big sea change. Now, if you once you put that in, once you push that forward as a disclosure requirement on the level of, of US GAAP or IFRS in the international markets, right? That that's a that carries tremendous uh, liability for board members and executive officers and um, it also obviously means that uh, they better have an op they better have a strategy for balancing their carbon emissions, right? So there are only a couple of two ways to get there, right? You, yeah. You, you slash your emissions, which generally means they're they're going to slash their production. That's what's happening, right? That that's if you look at the commodity sector, that's starting to happen. They're starting to cut production because they they're worried about this. Uh, that's what's coming in the U.S. as well. Right is similarly so. Um, he want Gensler has said he wants to see a rule in place by the end of this year, which is not far away. Yeah, uh, investors are are also pushing for this, uh, particularly visible, um, visible inv institutional investors like BlackRock. Right, so you know Larry Fink's out there pushing for for ESG uh, you know, stringent SEG, SE, uh, ESG disclosures and. Um, and considerations and investment decisions. So you know, th there's a lot of weight behind this. Um, and uh, then on the on the banking side, and I, you have uh, again led from really from from Europe and international is the Bank for International Settlement of International Settlement Settlements has said uh, that they want to see stress testing for banks, including 
climate change risks, right? And that came out earlier this year. Uh, the federal, the EU has already started in on implementing this uh, in their stress tests of banks. Um, and now the Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell, here in the U.S., has said that the U.S. is going to follow suit, that not only is the U.S. going to follow, follow suit, but he wants banks in the U.S. to even consider the climate risks and impacts of their clients and vendors and partners to be included in the stress tests that they are required to do, which is an impossible standard. Like, yeah, exactly. Impossible. <laughs> how are they going to do that? They couldn't possibly have enough information. It's a ridiculous standard. Yeah. But it shows you how far-reaching their willing, you know, the thinking is, and how committed they are. Then, of course, recently, just the, this last week, you have, you know, you have Biden announcing. you go. He's dramatically increasing the U.S.'s commitment to to uh, climate change. Climate change, right? And. and, and 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 to see actually all of the other prime ministers, you know, like uh, Boris, who got out from UK, and all of the other guys at the UN, which are meeting in New York right now. Right now. Yeah. Uh, well, they're all pushing for the same over and over agenda that we know for a fact that they want to put trillions and trillions of liquidity into such sector and make sure actually that it it keeps on the chi the climate change the climate change scheme going right they're pushing really hard on that so oh uh, it's it's all beneficial actually for a company like ours at the end of the day right correct i mean it's it's well let's talk about that for a second too so you have this desperation on the part of ceos and various you know leaders in the business community and the investment community yeah uh, to find to, to balance their their carbon emissions so either they slash production, get more, or get more efficient in their production, which is will hopefully happen over time. I imagine it will, um, but it's going to take time. Uh, or third, they have to acquire credits, and it's probably a combination of all three. Right? Is the right strategy? The problem, of course, is there aren't nearly enough credits out there. There's just not even close to the even with the current to meet the current level of regulatory requirements let alone what's coming uh so where are they going to find these credits on top of that you have an issue in the actual credit carbon credit market which is there's not really a a consistent quality or level of, tr uh, of transparency of credits so people are desperate to find credits to balance out their emissions portfolio, right, uh, profile. And at the same time, they, what's available, they don't really know what they're buying. They do their best and they, they try to put things through the paces. These are smart people. They bring on more smart people, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's just a fact that there is a dramatic undersupply of quality credits and an, a lack of ability to even gauge what, is a quality credit because even if they put a project through the paces once it's done they don't know if someone let's take in a forest project like what we've been discussing you know they don't know if someone came in and nobody's watching the forest right someone yeah. comes in and there, hacks down a quarter of the forest and so well, there's a there's an audit which is, is which is made at the beginning to identify how much carbon offset you know the forest let's say it's a natural based solution uh but after that nobody knows what really follows up and and they and these guys now are getting more educated uh they are very responsible and they want to make sure that they don't get caught uh being being sued because they're greenwashing and and of course now this is why we see the demand on our own right it's been a year that we've been working together we identified emitters which came to us we went to them and at the end of the day, they are looking for integrity. They are looking for quality product that at least if somebody finger point at them and say, hey, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Well, they can show proof of, wait, you know, first the business model shows that we are creating benefits on the social part of things. We are cre creating a benefit for the environment itself because we are actively managing the forest. We're replanting trees where we need to reforest and such and such, right? So they're looking for integrity. And as you say, 
there's many different projects which are small in sizes which don't deliver that level of integrity that these companies are looking for, correct? Correct. There's no, no a, a phrase that comes to mind when I listen to you put it that way, which I think you put it beautifully, is there's no integrity at scale. Yep, right. right? That's the problem. And so the problem is it's a mixed bet, right? You buy some here, you buy some there, you buy so there's not an organized market, which is yep. why there's a huge opportunity as well. And that's where... Um, why the commodity traders are, are looking at this and are coming in. You know, increasingly, um, what you have happening is uh, the, the traders see, you know, traders are always, this is like a trader's greatest dream is to find this kind of opportunity. I and mean, this is what they live for, right? A new yeah. commodity. Those don't come along very often. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be here for a long time, in all likelihood, right? I mean, I, I don't think we're going to uh, see the climate change issue resolve itself within the next well within the foreseeable future yeah. so um it's it's being viewed as a crisis and it's it's something that that requires immediate action and dramatic action and so so this is this has got commodity producers slashing production that's going to you know the demand isn't hasn't pulled back outside of covid Right, which pulled back on demand for a while, but you know, outside of that, um, yeah, the demand is going to keep you know trucking along. So this becomes this is going to further, which we've talked a lot about inflation, right? I mean, this is further driving inflation, right? So now, carbon is not only a huge opportunity. Well, look right now, the commodity prices are surging, right? Because investors know well, but there are a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is that, and people are talking about it here, certainly that uh, commodity producers are having to slash production driven in part be, by, by the emissions regulations um, yep. and the outlook on that. Supply that, chain by, issues. Uh, also. That too. But they're driving, that drives up the commodity prices. That's gonna permeate throughout the economy. It's gonna drive up you know, raw material costs. And, and clearly um, carbon is a factor there. And so, you know, carbon credits, therefore, are are really becoming an inflationary hedge. Exactly. That's the word. You know, I met years ago with a, um, a guy who ran uh, a, I did quite a, we did quite a bit of work together. He ran the oil and gas investment arm of, uh, of a major insurance company. We used to do a fair bit of work on the banking side. Um, and I talk and he, they had the best performance at, at one point obviously before the oil crash um, of the entire in in all of this massive insurance companies basically in almost the entire business um, and I said to him you know what 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 sort of precipitated this it seems like a very unique arm for a, for, for an insurance company they all have oil and gas arms and investment arms and what have you but they were very private equity like um, and then uh, they operated very, really autonomously. So, well, you know, at some point, you're going to have to tar your, tar your roof. And the insurance company knows that they, they're probably going to be involved in that, right? Or so, they have, so it's an inflationary hedge is where it started out. And so, you know, when you have, the point is when you have things you know, that they decided they want to be in that commodity, right? And so when you have things that are drivers of the inflation, right, and that are, are drivers because they're, they're everywhere in the supply chain and in the, uh, you know, throughout, across industries, that's a, that, that's a hedge you want to make. And that's what carbon has become. Yep. So it's that's really a fascinating time to be in this space. Oh, absolutely. And we're so early. We're part of the innovators uh, cycle, you know, the same way as Bitcoin back in maybe in between 2011 and 2013, when, you know, people were talking about it. A lot of people didn't understand it. So they stayed on the sideline. They had no clue what it really was. It was a new asset, difficult for people to understand because it's not even physical, right? It's fully digital. And to realize later down the road that everybody says, oh, my God, if I knew, you know, I have a friend who talked to me about Bitcoin, you know, like three years ago, and I shouldn't get involved there. I didn't. 
and now I regret it, right? So it, it's pretty much the same kind of component. So uh, now if we're talking about internally, uh, you've been involved uh, close to a year now with uh, all the partners here at Carbon Connect. Uh, short term, what is, so we already identified uh, this morning, uh, Josh, that we have sellers, which are, you know, like, indigenous communities who want actually, you know, to lend their forest, you know, and have part of a benefit uh, coming from the value that we can create through our manufacturing process. On the other end, there's obviously emitters and speculators which are looking for the kind of product that we are preparing. Uh, so now internally, we know we have buyers and sellers on both ends. Uh, we got by far oversubscribed in 48 hours, you know, on our first round of investment, which is a very amazing accomplishment in my opinion, because I was managing it. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> you know how humble I can be sometimes. Uh, <laughs> no, but back to being serious. I mean, what do you see, uh, because of your legal background, what do you see actually being the challenge that Carbon Connect is facing short term? Uh, I would say knowing that now we have emitters knocking at our doors, we have the indigenous communities on the other one. What do you see as being actually the challenges that we are facing short term before we can prepare to our 2022 season? Well, I, I, there are a few. So, of course, and there always are, right? But they're not, they're totally manageable challenges and we're making great yep. progress, right? So, in terms of the initial investment investors, right, and, and bringing on investors on board, um, we have a we're really fortunate to have a broad base of investors across the globe, which is huge. I mean, it's a tremendous opportunity um, for the investors and for Garden Connect, no question. So, what uh, the team is trying to do is to ensure that it's done right the first time, right? That we have um, uh, a process that is both compliant legally and that is um, s sort of seamless or smooth for the investors as well as um, affordable for the investors, right? Yeah, yeah. Cutting, to... cutting actually as many third parties as possible at one end to reduce the fees of wire transfers and such and such. So I understand that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that that's right. And, and even things like foreign exchange and what have you. So, um, so that's, that's part of it. So we're working through that. It's um, our law firm Dentons is a you know, global firm and they've been uh, great in helping work through some of those issues. Um, but uh, we're, we're pretty much there now. We're just waiting for translation, frankly, of documents. Yep. and um, and uh, for the uh, the online platform that will be facilitating the raise to just to, to upload everything and, and finalize and then we'll we'll get it out there and the beauty is that the next time we'll be ready with a process that we build because we want to get it right the first time right we want to build this and um, and make sure that it was compliant make sure that it was seamless and smooth affordable uh, you know, efficient and be able to go back to that same system and have a machine that we can go back to repeatedly. So that's, yeah. that's where I think we've, we've, we've come. And the beauty of this business also, and I think I mentioned this earlier when we were discussing Martin is there are a lot of, uh, different ways to involve investors because there are so many, uh, avenues for for investment right and for a return obviously those are synonymous right um but the th that's really a gift to the investors and to the company because we can over time roll out new investment products or investment uh, opportunities that uh, meet the requirements and demands of different investors and, and and this is where Josh, I find absolutely amazing that not we are not only that we are uh, as a company in a very trendy environment, you know, like the market is asking for that kind of product. But on the other hand, we have the expertise and the skill set 
to deliver financial tools which will create liquidity. I mean, like the idea for the first rounder and the second rounder coming for the second round of investors, uh, uh, the idea actually to be able to trade internally actually their convertible notes into liquidity if they lose their job they want to cash out as quick as possible to create these kind of technologies because technologies now provide these kind of layers and of course we have to make sure that we comply with all of the legal aspect and make sure that we are regulated in the proper markets but now we have the technology tools and we have the expertise on board which allows us not only to develop through our scientist groups uh, a, a beautiful data collections of information regarding the data of the forest itself, but now we can turn it into a financial tool will support actually the investors who wants to go liquid. And I think this is such an amazing and exciting component coming on our end for the next few months, right? Yeah, I think so. We obviously were evaluating what that'll look like and, you know, we haven't, we haven't stated in those documents or required in the investment documents that that people participate in that if and when it becomes available. Yeah. But, um, but we certainly intend as to explore those options to provide those benefits to investors over time and to create uh, that sort of liquidity by that that, be, that has become recently available through um, well DeFi communities and through uh, and through the technology technology that we have at our disposal um so yeah really excited about that um i think investors will, should be too uh, because they can they can kind of they can make a bet and they don't have to be stuck with it forever uh if their life circumstances change or if they have had have hit their return requirement and they say you know what i want to or they find something else that they really want to move on uh, yeah, exactly that these things yeah. I, I think it's the perfect mix, actually, of a bit of everything, right? We can bring some technology on board. We can bring a physical asset on board, which now for the first time in history, we can financially value the asset by actively managing it and making sure that it's healthy. And it brings good value, actually, to our parties as well, which is the indigenous communities uh, and such and such, right? So the business model is prop proper for what we are doing. And on the other end, on the marketing side of things, these, and these companies, the emitters, they have a beautiful story that they can spin to their investors saying, hey man, we're just not buying offsets because we have to do so, but we're doing it also because it creates benefit for the indigenous communities and dealers and for the forest itself. Uh, so one last question for you, Josh, before I let you go. Um, and of course, I know you're going to be, you know, a pumper here and it's fine because we deserve it. Uh, we've been working really hard for one year, you know, to make sure that our strategy is proper, our business model is proper, uh, that we have actually a market validation, right? Uh, what is your core feeling? I know you're excited as much as I am, you know, to be part of that story, uh, what is actually your core feeling regarding working with the team that we are building right now? Well, I, I'll answer that. Can I quickly, one other point on this legal? Yeah, part, please do. Another please do. Part to your previous question, which is the other legal challenges. Um, and I just, I just, I want to be really transparent and talk about that a bit. Um, so the transparency is obviously a, a central sort of tenet of this team. I mean, we really, strive to not only bring transparency to the market, but be transparent ourselves. So in that vein, one of the legal challenges, obviously, that we have to work through, we have to be frank about this, is we have to, uh, we have a lot of work to do with the, with the indigenous partners that we have. And um, that's just work that we're doing collaboratively with them. They're really receptive and supportive, uh, which is great, but they're just things that have to be structured and they have to be set up properly. Um, and I think to underscore or validate how um, comfortable we are that we'll get there on those things, um, of course, there's always risk. Anything can happen. But that the fact is we are talking to, more, well, we're working with more and more um, buyers of carbon credits and like large scale, you know, big emitters and 
traders, right, who represent those emitters or who are buying for their own portfolio, um, who on the basis of an MOU, as opposed to having all the documents done, right, they're getting comfortable enough and our, and our project development documents, right, which are, which are pretty, are very technical and yeah. extensive. Um, but on the basis of that and the strength of the team and the strength of the project, um, those, they're, they're starting to commit dollars, right, to these kinds of projects. And they're, well, we have m many of them chasing to, to do the same with us. So we're in discussions, right? So that, that to me is a big vote of confidence for uh, how we will be able to, the prospects of us being able to successfully navigate those legal issues. Um, as well as, frankly, affirm the size of a Dentons, right, and, and the stature of Dentons want, wanting to work with us and committing real resources and time and expertise to do so. Um, so that, to me, uh, says a lot. Um, and uh, I have little doubt we'll be able to, to navigate those legal challenges successfully, but they are there. And it's part of the way. It's part of the part of the job. Yeah, and not even including everything else regarding, you know, the uh, situation that we are all in right now, you know, like with the COVID matters and such, many different employees are not working from the office, they're working remotely, it creates challenges for these companies, they might have less employees to work with, y you know, all of these things add on. So uh, that that might delay things. But at the end of the day, as you said, these challenges can be actually, you know, we, we can go through them through time. Um, so back to my question about excitement now. <laughs> yes. Uh, so back to the excitement of the team. Well, that does bring, it, that bring us back. But the truth is the demand yeah. continues to build. It just continues to build because the regulation continues to push it yeah. and uh, investor demand continues to push it. So as far as this team, um, I, I think the team is the special sauce for this business, right? You have technologists, Forestry, you know, we have a fourth generation forester leading the company with experience in the crypto markets, uh, you know, as a you know, mining crypto, et cetera, and a passion for, for DeFi, right? Um, we have uh, a really brilliant strategist uh, and policy um, you know, expert in, in Tim on, and, and markets expert. Um, and uh, that really helps with great relationships with the indigenous, right? With tremendous indigenous relationships, which is probably uh, one of the one of the biggest moats, if not the biggest moat around our business, right? Yeah. Um, is those long standing indigenous relationships. Um, we have in Jacques Prescott, a tremendous sustainability expert uh, and scientist with uh, very active relationships with the people who are writing carbon credit qualification standards, right? <laughs> and, and a voice in that process. Um, and, uh, you know, we have uh, real technologists and experts, you know, you know through you and your network. Um, and so I think we have a, uh, you know, we have a tremendous, we have others on the team who come from the capital market side, uh, like myself and, and, and one of our other partners. Um, and, uh, we just have a really robust team, but beyond all that is, which all makes sense, right? These are all in a hub and spoke model as we would think about it. We have the expertise in these various areas that tie into the, into the business that are critical, but it's pretty unique to have that mix of people just in terms of capabilities, very unique. And I won't name names of our competitors out there, but we know who they are. They don't have that. They don't have that mix of technologists, scientists, you know, uh, uh, and and forest really boots on the ground foresters, right? Um, and the team we, we have that in our team, which I think is incredibly powerful and interesting. What? But there's a glue among the team that I think is even more interesting and exciting, and probably prom and promising, which is really a shared vision and a shared. Uh, values, like, like I think I don't know. I see a lot of startups. I work with a lot of technology companies and management teams, etc. Um, I think there's a really special sort of bond among this group that uh, is a is an important one because things like uh, you know the, the that get everyone jazzed uh, uh, to go to work is 
uh, the benefit to the indigenous communities, the benefit to the environment, the opportunity, obviously the financial opportunity that everybody sees, um, the, the commitment to transparency and quality. Um, all of these things are really important to have a team that stays together um, and that maximizes contributions across the whole team. So I think, um, the, and, and with all that comes a tremendous amount of trust, right? So I think, uh, I think that's part of it too. So I think, uh, I guess in short, to roll all that up, I am tremendously excited about this team because not only is, do we have the capability to get there uh, on, all, on all fronts, but there's also um, the glue that holds everyone together, which is the shared values, culture, et cetera. And that's the stuff that, you know, that's like the gas in the car, right? <laughs> You're not going anywhere without it. Yeah, on, on my end, if I may say, uh, Josh is uh, there's another component which I find very interesting, and it's funny because this week, you know, we had very deep conversation as a team about our philosophy, you know, the the way that we want to develop the company in the future, and uh, we absolutely want you know to benefit as a team of everything of what we will put in place way more than value specific individuals and. I, I come from the hockey world, uh, being, as you can imagine, uh, a Montreal Canadian fan. <laughs> and, and the reality is that, you know, teams highly value as well, you know, the fans, the audience, the seven players, as we can call them, right, in a hockey in a hockey game, you know, you got the goalie, you've got five guys in front of him, but you also have 17 to 21,000 people in the stands which are cheering for you. And we also demonstrated, you know, lately that we have a massive army of investors who not only wants to support the company financially to make sure that we will progress, but also it shows that the people wants to support actually the company on the other end too. So I want to also acknowledge that by the first round of investors who showed up with so much commitment and so much will that now I have family offices knocking on my door. I got forest managers from Europe, Europe because they're the cousin of the investor or they're friends with the investor and they know someone who works at Nestle and Nestle is an emitter so they can come to Carbon Connect. I mean, these kind of things will grow the potential of our structure because we have these guys on board now. So I want to value that as well. And I know you do too, right? Absolutely. I think that's, that is another part of the value that, that everybody shares is how can we involve, how, how do we bring this opportunity to more people or who are like-minded who see the opportunity and aren't um, just some big institutional faceless investor, right? Uh, we don't just want to, to, you know, we want to bring those groups in to advance projects and et cetera, because they can come in with scale. But, but we really want to share that opportunity. We talk about this a lot, as you know, with, yeah. with folks like the people in your community who are ready to commit and, and get involved with their checkbook, with their connections, with their, uh, you know, in the case of foresters, they want to come in and, and get boots on the ground and get to work. Um, so it's very interesting. Josh, uh, I can't thank you enough for the beautiful conversation today once again. Um, hopefully, you're going to enjoy a bit of your time. Uh, I know you, you've been in Mexico uh, for business purposes uh, last week, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And now you're going somewhere else. Where are, are you going to Argentina or something like that? Did I miss that? I'm going to Colombia. but Colombia. Wedding. <laughs> oh, wedding. Okay, not yours because it's already done, right? Yeah, mine's already done. But <laughs> I am bringing my wife, though, as proof of that wedding. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's all, always a good thing, right? Yeah, no, it's great. We're really looking forward to it. We'll get some time at some point. So uh, I might sneak in a little bit a little bit of business here and there with you know, some, some firms I've worked with in Colombia, but we'll see. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. And, and, and can't wait to meet you physically. It's been a year that we're working together and we never had the chance actually to physically meet. And this yeah. is uh, what's gonna happen at the end of October where the all the partners of Carbon Connect is gonna meet in British Columbia. So we're gonna, because there's so much things to do and we need a team building event that we can actually spend time together 
and really, you know, focus, razor sharp focus on what has to be done by the end of this year and what has to be done to prepare for 2022. So, man, I can't wait to see you there. It's going to be very exciting. And again, thank you. thank you very much for your time, Josh. Well, I can't wait either. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, you know, we, we've obviously, the team has met in different pieces, have met each other. But it's amazing what, what you, how far you can get these days with, uh, you know, with a dis with a distributed team, it's really incredible. Yeah, it, it, through the limitation, you know, at least now we have technology to compensate, so we could accomplish so much stuff and meet so many different peoples, even virtually. Yeah. It's it, tech is amazing. Tech is amazing, and DeFi will be even more amazing. <laughs> well, we'll do our part, right, to make it so. Thank you very much, Josh, once again. J'espère chacun d'entre vous que vous avez apprécié l'entrevue d'aujourd'hui. Just probably one last word from you, Josh, to say hello to our, uh, to our group today. Well, thank you all for listening and thank you for being here and watching. Um, and thank you for your support, really. We, we talk about it a lot. We value it and we really appreciate it. And we can't have you all, wait to have you on for the ride. Thanks. Alors, on se voit tous pour la vidéo du vendredi, tel que vous le savez, n'est-ce hein, pas? Donc, je serai avec vous demain pour une vidéo en direct et l'entrevue sera déposée immédiatement après la fin de celle-ci. Alors, si vous avez des, des questions, des informations à partager avec nous, n'hésitez pas. Vous pouvez communiquer directement avec moi sur carbonconnect.io ou à mon adresse courriel personnel m prescott, p r e s c o t t à carbonconnect.io. Bonjour à tous. Merci, Josh. Salut tout le monde. À bientôt.